I'm Dr. Carrie Horn, author of A Soul Aligned, How God Heals His Creations, and Heart Noon Series Workbook, a practical application workbook for biblical healing. I'm not real sure where this video is going to go. I just know that there are some things that God wants me to talk about, to share with you. And there are some things I'm going to share with you about what God's doing in me that, of course, I have asked and prayed about and discerned whether or not to share this because God is doing some things in me that I want my rewards. <laughs> I am not trying to get my rewards here through the accolades of man. But this is something important that he's pressing on me and telling me this is something you need to share. This is something that you need to share this journey and what this looks like in practical application. And so the first thing I want to say to you is that anyone who tells you that your testimony is not important, that your testimony is not enough, that you need to somehow substantiate the claims of your testimony with a wise in your own eyes worldly backup they just might not have a testimony to share. Our testimony matters. The Holy Spirit speaks into our testimony. That is, he is the only substantiation that we need. And everything that we share, everything we talk about, everything we experience and we receive from God should be backed up by the word and the spirit. If it's not, we need to test where that's coming from. We need to question where that's coming from. And I've said so many times that the right arm doesn't seem to have anything to do with the left leg until we look at the whole body, that God is always weaving together a picture, even if the pieces don't seem to go together, he will weave it together. So knowing that, we just have to receive all of it and start putting the pieces together, start writing them down in our journals, and he will put that picture together. And lately, I've had people contacting me through emails and comments and wanting to know more about this covenant that we have with God, what is required of them in order to be saved? How do I obey? How do I not treat God as a list of do's and don'ts? How do I truly receive his ministry? And how do I be moved by his spirit to obey his laws and be careful to keep his decrees? And my personal prayer is always to hear God's voice. I always want to hear his voice. I am always panting for more of God for more of his voice, for more of his instruction and direction and peace and joy. So that's always my prayer. But particularly this week, that has been a really strong desire in my heart to hear him, to be led by him, to be instructed by him. And I've been leaning into that a lot each day. And concurrently, and this is where the right arm isn't going to seem like it has anything to do with the left leg, God's been talking to me about this pair of shoes in my closet, this pair of shoes that it took me a very long time to buy. And I've owned these pair of shoes probably for about five years, four or five years, and I've worn them two times. And the most recent time that I wore them was at my daughter's wedding, just for the pictures. And I felt grieved when I wore them. I felt dirty about them. And there was a time in my life when I would wear certain clothes or certain shoes. And I would enjoy when people would tell me, oh, you're so stylish. You have such a good style. Oh, I love your shoes. I love your outfit. And I would enjoy that. And I would think who I was. But it's no longer a part of my identity. God tells me that I'm supposed to be dressed in humility, in sackcloth and ashes, in the righteous acts of God's people, not in the world, not of the world. So he began to talk to me about these shoes and start working my heart into getting rid of these shoes, letting me know that I have no business having the world in my life, in my closet, on my body. And last night, he began really convicting me, really heavy, really hard. And he started talking to me about my entire closet of shoes. And he began giving me memories, rising memories up, of the life that I lived, of luxury and wealth, of worldliness, of thinking who I was, of showing me the sin and the misery that that led to. He had given me all of the things that the world had deceived me into believing, that my flesh had deceived me into believing would bring joy and happiness and fulfillment. He had given me physical beauty and 
wealth. As far as money was concerned, I did not want. But I was consumed by a spirit of fear. I did not have love. I attracted the spiritually dead. I hung out with the spiritually dead. And I was constantly handing myself over to the vultures. As the Bible says, men who weasel themselves into the houses of widows and fatherless and gullible women. That was my life. That's what I did. And I looked great on the outside, but there was nothing there on the inside. I was compelled by a spirit of fear to keep chasing what was missing in a life of debauchery and idolatry, a life that the world says is glamour, in the fallacy of having arrived. And now I find myself trying to get back to a place of humility and simplicity, joy, peace, love, reliance on God, afflicting myself and breaking my flesh down so that I can hear the voice of God, so that his power can rest on me, so that I can be complete in that conformity, in that alignment with him. And last night he began talking to me about that closet and I became grieved and unsettled in my spirit. And he's talking to me about the sin and he's showing me the life that I was living and the misery that I felt and the just disgusting loathing that I felt from giving myself over, giving myself over constantly this prostitution to the world, the overwhelming and compelling fear of punishment. Any minute now, they're going to find out who I am. Any minute now, they're going to find out I'm a fraud. Even though I didn't know that I was living dishonestly, that I was living outside of who I truly am, I had that imposter feeling all the time. And guess what? The world ate it up. I had status. I had prestige. I had money. I had a reputation within my field. And having stripped all of that off, having given all of that up, I now find myself doing the most honest thing I've ever done in my entire life, <laughs> sharing my testimony, sharing my experiences, exposing my sin, being the daily sacrifice that God has called me to be, a living sacrifice, bearing my testimony. And most people don't want it. They don't want to hear it. They say to the seers, see no more visions, and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, prophesy illusions. This is the attitude of most people on this earth. But once you tasted the heavenly gift, once you know what it is to be in Christ, what else can you do? It's the only thing that matters. But last night I was grieved. Last night I was grieved for a couple reasons. One, because of what God was showing me about my sin, what God was showing me about where I'd been. But the other part was something that kind of surprised me because I thought that I'd dealt with this. I thought he had dealt with me on this. I didn't want to give up my shoes. <laughs> I didn't want to give up my shoes. And there have been times where I've handled things where I just kind of like went in there and just did it and separated from my feelings about it. Just went in there. It just did what he told me to do. But he kept pressing on me that I needed to feel my feelings about this. And, I, and most of the time, I believe it is important for us to feel our feelings about it. God gave us those feelings. We need to feel our feelings in order to truly receive his ministry. Otherwise, it's just us going through the motions of something as though it is, is a ritual. We need to feel the feelings about it. And so there have been times where... I've done the thing and then he's caused me to feel the feelings later because it was too overwhelming in the moment. I just needed to kind of do it in pieces. And part of the reason I'm sharing this process with you is because people have been asking about this. How do I follow Christ? How do I follow? What rules do I need to do? What do I need to do? And this is what I'm trying to share and illustrate with you is that there's not a list. There's not a list of rules. We receive that by his spirit. His laws are written on our hearts and minds. 
but not as a list of rules. His laws are written on our hearts and minds by his spirit. His spirit is going to let us know when we need to do these things. That's how you live into it. And just because his spirit tells me that I need to go in my closet and I need to gather these shoes and I need to get rid of the world from my house, from my heart, it's not about getting rid of the shoes. It's not about the act of getting rid of the shoes. It's about what's going on in my heart, what he is doing to me, how he is changing me. And so if I just get rid of the shoes, but I repress the feelings, I'm not going to be able to be changed. I'm not going to be able to understand that it's the identity that I'm grieving with those shoes. Even though that identity disgusts me and repulses me and he's showing me what was associated with that identity, I need to integrate and transition from that identity to the identity that he's bringing me into. And that's not something that happens all at once. Our character, we're becoming holy as God is holy. Our character is being changed through this ministry. We are becoming sanctified of these things. We are becoming holy as God is holy. And although that's something that the Holy Spirit does, he does it with our cooperation. It is a collaborative process, not something that we could have done in and of ourselves, but that does not absolve us of our part in that, our role in that, feeling our feelings, acknowledging the feelings that God gave us, the feelings, by the way, that God also has, feelings that are good and right by design. And so I began to grieve and cry and resist and struggle and feel the feelings that God gave me. Just because I'm resisting and struggling doesn't mean that I'm not going to obey him. It doesn't mean that I can choose whether or not I'm going to obey him and still receive rewards. God says there's only two options. You obey or you disobey. There's not a middle ground. And he says that he sends blessing for obedience and punishment for disobedience. There's no middle ground. I can't continue to hold on to the world and think that, well, I'm just not doing it right now. No, if God says do it now and I choose not to do that, I'm disobeying him. And because his will is for my flesh to be broken and for me to become sanctified and holy as he is holy, he's going to bring more experiences. He's going to bring more. His voice is going to increase in order to bring me into position because his will will be accomplished. So I felt that resistance and I felt that grief. And concurrently, I know that I must obey. I know and I believe and I have faith and I must live that faith that God knows what's best for me, that I don't know what's best for me. And if God says, get rid of the shoes, I need not say, but I might need this pair for such and such, but I might need this one later on, God. If he says, do it, I've got to do it. But I also know, and I want you to hear this and take it to heart, please. It is not enough to just go through the motions. And so I know that I have to be brought, my heart has to measure up, has to line up with what I'm doing. Otherwise, my confidence won't be in him and I keep looking back. Remember what happened to Sarah, Lot's wife, when she looked back? She hadn't quite reconciled what she was giving up. She hadn't quite reconciled that she was leaving Sodom and Gomorrah. Our hearts have to line up with what we're doing. Otherwise, we're going to look back. Otherwise, we're going to fall. And it's not something that we do in and of ourselves. It's something that we pray for and we receive from God. And so I prayed and I asked God, please turn my heart. Please turn my heart to what you're asking me to do. 
and he began to give me memories and he began to speak with me in order to bring my heart into position. And I didn't immediately go to my closet and start pulling the shoes. I wasn't there yet. I was tracking with myself, attuning myself to where I was. Have I gotten there yet? Because it's more important for my heart to be there first than for me to go through the works and to have a heart that's in conflict. I pulled that one box, the first box of shoes that God had spoken with me about, and I pulled them out of the closet and I set them on my TV console and I felt the feelings of what it felt like to begin to let go of those shoes to begin to let go of the identity associated with buying those shoes, being able to afford those shoes that, by the way, could feed a family for three months at least. How disgusting. And these are the things that God began to cause me to feel, to cause me to realize how could we possibly say that we're God's people when we're dressing ourselves in that and we're going out to eat And the people that are waiting on us are struggling to feed their families. And we justify ourselves saying, well, I'm a good tipper. I give them a good tip. I remember where I came from because these are the things I used to do and justify myself. I've arrived here. I earned this. But I remember where I came from. I'm still super humble. I throw them a little extra tip. I used to work that job. When we are in the body of Christ, no one's rich and no one's poor. We're all just one. We're all the body of Christ. We're not supposed to be dressed in worldliness. And those who have been given much, much is required. In the early days when the father was drawing me to the son, he had let me know that I was going to be receiving a portion of money, a large portion of money, and that that money was going to be used for this building that I was purchasing. And before that happened, God had me write a covenant with him. And I didn't really know much about a covenant or the covenants that he has made with his people. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't even, I didn't know that was the pattern of God to do that. But he did indeed have me write a covenant with him. And one of the things that he had me write down was that I would give myself a reasonable income and the rest of the money was to be reinvested, that it was to be used for his ministry, that I was not to become rich. Just because I had money, I was not to become rich. I was not to ever think of that money as being mine. And I was to ask with everything that I spent I was to ask him and make sure that that was okay, that it was acceptable to him. And as we were remodeling that building, I asked him about every single thing. And it was actually very fun because I wasn't doing it by myself. I was always asking him, what color do you want me to paint the walls? What fixtures do you want me to put? All of these things. And he did that with me and it turned out beautiful. And he was teaching me many different things, one of which being... If you make the decisions with me, you will never look back. But if you don't, you will not have confidence in what you've done. Even things as simple as what color paint to put on the walls. But the other thing that he was teaching me, and it was interesting because I would still say that I was fairly worldly at that time. Although he was quickly stripping me of that, I still was attached to a lot. So the other thing that he was teaching me was to monitor to have some sort of a gauge of whether or not something was godly or not. So whereas before I had gone out to the jeweler and was, you know, collecting jewelry that he later had me get rid of, I was collecting shoes, almost like a collector's item. I mean, literally collecting shoes like, oh, these are made of velvet. Oh, these are made of, you know, whatever it is collecting them like a collector's item while people are starving, while people like my mother are cleaning the toilets of the rich. That was what I came from. That's where I was 
raised. I used to go with my mother and clean the toilets of the rich, clean their houses. And I'll tell you something, I had more peace and understanding back in those humble, simple days than I did when I thought I had arrived. When God's people are given money by God, they understand that it's not their money. They understand that they are to have a reasonable income, that they are to stay connected to him on what to spend that money on, and that it is to be reinvested in the ministry of God. That is what it's given for. Nothing we have is ours. It's all been given by God. It can all be taken away by God. So God's people do not become more worldly as they are given money. They actually become more humble. They actually become more circumcised because that is something that God does within us. I want you to discern this. I want you to look at this. How is this playing out in churches, in those who claim to be servants of God? How is it playing out? What are they dressed in? Because God tells us what we are supposed to be adorned in. And he tells us that when his people come back, when the armies of heaven return, they're dressed in white linen, which stands for the righteous acts of God's people. That's what we are supposed to be dressed in. That is what is beautiful to God. That is the fruit of God's servants. It's not of the world. And we're told that God's witnesses come dressed in sackcloth and ashes. Obviously, this is spiritual significance, right? Early on in the Bible, God did these things literally. And as time went on, He was teaching us the spiritual significance of tangible objects. So let's not be deceived. Two men aren't going to show up in sackcloth and ashes with fire coming out of their mouths like a a dragon. That's not going to happen. Sackcloth and ashes represents humility, reducing ourselves, repentance, grief. These are the reasons why sackcloth and ashes were put on and the fire coming out of their mouths is the consuming fire of God. If we don't understand these things, we're not going to understand who the witnesses are. We're not going to be able to discern the values of God. We're going to be our flesh is going to be so enticed and so in awe of things the very things that are in opposition to God. Those who are dressed in the world and have a message that tells us what our itching ears want to hear versus those who are dressed in the humility that Christ was dressed in when he came here, didn't even have a place to lay his head. That's what we're told in the Bible. Didn't even have a place to lay his head. And remember that the Pharisees didn't recognize him because they were looking for something that appealed to their flesh. How dare you say you're the son of God? Look at you. We're dressed nicer than you. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The witnesses are preparing the way again for Christ to come. They are preparing the way again. They are similar in their function to John the Baptist. They're going to come just like John the Baptist came. They're not going to come dressed in the world. Here was a man who wore camel hair, ate locusts and honey, and cried out into, in the wilderness These are going to be the foolish, small things of the world. 
foolish of the world because it's crazy talk what they speak to the world. The world considers that foolishness. They're not talking about the things the world values. They're not talking about the things that bring prestige and esteem to the prince of the world. They're not going to be talking on that authority. They're not going to be talking for their own glory. They're not going to be dressed in the world. They're going to be dressed in the righteousness of God. They're going to be dressed in humility and repentance. They're going to be the foolish things of the world. And when you see them, when you hear them, the devil's going to try to say, what is this? This is in opposition to everything that you know to be true in the world. What is this that this person is speaking? They're a fool. Who are they? Look how they look. Does this look like a servant of God to you? And you need to ask yourself the question, what does God value? And what do the servants of God look like? What does the Bible tell us? How did Christ come? Were they dressed in fancy clothes? Were they respected by the world? Or were they called crazy? Were they laughed at, despised, persecuted, beheaded? What will the witnesses of God look like? What will they be dressed in? God already told us sackcloth and ashes. What does that look like? What does it look like now? Physically, and what does it look like spiritually? So I want you to understand that there are people who have less money in their bank accounts who live more worldly. There are people who have more money in their bank accounts who live more humbly. Don't judge things the way that the world judges them. You need to judge them as God judges them. What are they dressed in? How are they investing that money? How are they using what's been given to them? The concept of rich or poor is a matter of the heart, poor in spirit. That means whatever amount of money is in your bank account, you are always to remain poor in spirit. It's not the money that reflects your heart. It is your heart and the way that you are living. And God is going to tell you what to do. He is going to tell you how to use what he has given you. He is going to tell you how to remove what is not of him. He is going to tell you how to dress yourself. He's going to tell you that we are not supposed to stock up or hoard or store our treasures here, but we are supposed to store in heaven. He is going to tell you how to dispense what he has given you. It's not as the world does. You know, like in the world, we go to an accountant or a financial planner and they tell us how to strategize. They tell us this is the best way for you to, you know, invest your money or whatever it is. This is the best way to maximize your write-offs, right? But God doesn't do that. That's not my experience of what God does. He has given us what he has given us. He expects us to use for the reason he's given it to us. So in my experience, he's never had me donate to a place where I'm going to get a tax write-off. He has had me give directly where he wants me to give that money, even if there's no write-off. Now, why does he do that? Because he wants our hearts to learn how to give for him, how to understand that we have been given this for his purposes, not for self-gain, not to be attached to that self-gain. His goals are what is done in the heart. That's what he wants. He wants true believers who are going to be reconciled by their lived faith in their heart, who are not going to be conformed according to the pattern of the world or what the world tells them that they should do. What the world tells them is good. He wants us to be conformed according to his pattern, according to his spirit, according to his instruction. So I want to answer this question that many people have asked about regarding how do we be moved by his spirit? How do we keep this covenant? Where's where's the list 
of rules that we need to follow in order to be saved. And I want you to know that this is this is not a new question. This is a question that people have been asking God for thousands of years. And when Christ was here, the people asked him yet again. He had just gotten done feeding the 5,000 and they said, what are the works that God requires of us in order to be saved? And Christ said, the work of God is this, is to believe in the one he sent. Now, if you cherry pick that scripture, you're going to come up with your own idea about what does it mean to believe? But if you have a heart for God, you're going to search the scriptures about what the scriptures say is the fruit of one who believes. You're going to see that Christ says you have to become his disciple. You got to pick up your daily cross. You got to become like a child. You got to love your enemies and pray for your enemies. These are all things that are done in the heart. If you believe, you will obey. If you love him, you'll seek his heart. And we're told in Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, that when we are made a new creation, God removes our heart of, fl- of stone. He gives us a heart of flesh, a softened heart. And he places his spirit in our heart. And he will move us by his spirit to follow his laws and be careful to keep his decrees. And he also tells us that when he revoked the first covenant, he would make a new covenant with his people where he would write his laws. It would be a new covenant in the sense that he would write his laws on their hearts and minds. Well, now, why is he writing his heart, the laws on their hearts and minds, if he doesn't require obedience in the covenant? If once you believe and receive that you've already been saved, that's a false doctrine. If you are in Christ, you must be moved by his spirit. His spirit must be moving you to obey, to be careful to obey his laws and follow his decrees. That's a requirement. It's a requirement of the covenant. Now, is it written somewhere in the law, thou shalt clean out thy closet and remove thy shoes and give them to the poor? No, that is not written somewhere in the law or laws or decrees. But what is written is that his spirit is placed in us And will begin to move us to obey what he desires. And that is what he desires. He desires that I will be dressed in the righteous acts of God's people. That I will be dressed in humility. That I will be dressed as a servant of God, not a servant of the world. That I will be recognizable to the people of God. That's his desire. I hope and pray that that has been helpful to you. And I hope and pray that one of the things in this story that will stand out to you is that it's not a list. It's not a checklist of just going to my closet and and getting rid of stuff. God wants my heart and he's designed me with feelings in order to communicate with me. And so as I'm feeling those feelings and I'm bringing them to God and I'm saying, Lord, I'm resisting this. I want to obey you. I will obey you but I need your help. I need your help to, to talk with me, help me, help me understand why I'm resisting this so I can resolve that with you. Okay. So he starts talking to me about the identity associated with this. He starts talking to me about everything that went into getting to a place where I could afford those shoes and what that meant to me and how I started rending my heart to the world defining myself by what I had and how that was in opposition to the desire of God. That was in opposition to the heart. That was in opposition to the reason he even gave me that money to begin with. And then I needed to return, that my heart needed to return to him, that I needed to remember who I am and where I come from, not where I came from here, where I come from, who I've been set apart to be. And he began to walk me through all of the memories of having had material wealth, of pursuing that in the world and thinking that I had arrived, thinking that now I'll be happy. Now I'll be able to attract all of the things that I want in a man. Come on. That actually caused me to attract worse men. Why? 
because of the material wealth? No, because of where my heart was. So please don't dismiss, don't disregard the design that God has given you because that's the design that he's speaking into. That's the reason why the world tells you your feelings don't matter. You don't need to, you're being too sensitive. Stay in your cognitions and behaviors, your mind and body. That's where the power is. And it's a lie. God speaks in our feelings. God works with our feelings. God works with our heart. So become attuned to it. Become attuned to the things that matter to God. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.